Hey there, everybody. Thank you so very much for stopping by one more time and hanging out with here as TLC presents Todd Versations. We are thrilled to have you join us once again. We are excited about who we've got sitting next to me over here. Please, everybody, give it up for my friend, Rodrigo Bedoya. Welcome, my friend. Hi, Todd. How are you? Very Beautiful. happy to be here. Thank you. I'm happy that you are here. I really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day down in Lima, Peru. Uh, changing the world for the better. And that's what I'm excited to talk about today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm was thinking about this all week, you know, prior to us getting together. And I'm just excited about it because one of the things that I love about this platform and something I believe in wholeheartedly is that we need to be talking about these conversations that are driving positive costs into food. And when I think about that and I think about your story, um, it exemplifies that. It's the meaning of that. I think what you guys are doing is so worthy of people's time and energy to understand and to listen and to embrace, um, which we'll share with everybody in greater detail. But I wanted to touch on it beforehand with us because I feel so passionately about what you guys are doing because it's just it's just right, right? And, and I just love that, right? And I think it's fantastic. You know, one of the interesting things is, is not only have you built a company now that you know, it, it working to change people's lives, you're importing product all over the globe, uh, or excuse me, exporting product all over the globe. But, you, you know, you've gone from the your small start to almost 300 employees, almost 3000 jobs created outside of your company. But one of the things I find amazing to me that I'm just so proud of what you guys do is the way you're taking care of your people, which is you're leading the charge down there amongst anybody else. And so, for you guys to be able to do things like pay people a better wage, offer health care, offer retirement, offer financial assistance and help and guidance, um, paid vacations. I mean, it's some of this stuff is unheard of in your space. And what impacted me the most is the way that you're working with women inside your organization to uplift them and their families, because domestic violence is a big problem. There's issues down there. Um, Women are getting an opportunity through your system to understand, learn finance, learn to take care of their things, find ways to get credit, to establish a new life. And you, brother, are changing the community around you in such an impactful way. And so I want to throw that on the table first and tell you what an honor it is for you to be taking time out of your day to hang out with us and share your story. So a welcome one more time to you. Thank you, Doug. I, I am very honored to be here. I have been following you for, for quite a while now, so, so I am very, very happy to be with you here. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate it. So let's get started. I mean, I got a lot of questions. And I want to get into this. I want to get in the weeds because I think your message needs to go inspire people. We need to make changes, right? We need to be driving positive costs into food. And I think this is a great lesson on how to do that. So would you just start off and tell me how three guys in college <laughs> were out inspecting farms and fields and woke up one day and said, hey, I got an idea. So share with us a little bit how the grandma started. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so we, are, we are three co-founders. So Janos, Diego, and me. So after graduating from, from college, just, just almost the day after graduation, um, I got an interview at a Dutch certifier who has their only office in Latin America here in Lima, Peru. In fact, just one block away from where I am sitting right now. Wow. And, um, and um, I was hired to become an organic inspector. And a couple of weeks later, um, they asked me if I had friends with a profile similar to mine, which is you had to be an agronomist, you had to speak good English, and you have to have the availability to travel all through Latin America. So I, I got a few uh, uh, CVs from, from my friends from college, and Janos and Diego were hired. Janos was hired a couple of weeks after me, and Diego was hired like a month or so after that. Mm -hmm. And then we spent we spent uh, spent a couple of years um, traveling all through Latin America, inspecting and auditing farming operations of all sizes and types, um, mm -hmm. from the smallest uh, coffee co-op in the jungle of Peru to uh, quinoa co-ops in in the highlands in the Andes highlands to um, sesame growers in Paraguay and meat producers in Uruguay, all the way to mid-sized fruit companies in the Dominican Republic, and even, even all the way to large multinational companies like Dole. So wow. we, were, we were inspecting Dole farms in, in Ecuador and Central America. And, but a couple of years after doing that, 
um, we wanted to be more connected to the soil, to, to the farm itself, to, to producing mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as agronomists. And, um, but we had no land and we had no money to buy land. And on the other hand, small scale growers are all, all over Peru. There are, there are thousands, even millions of small scale growers in our country. So that is when we decided to apply and, and adjust what we have seen in our travels, in our trips, mm -hmm. and made this model of, of um, working with small scale growers. So what we do is we teach them, we oversee their compliance with standards and regulations, mm -hmm. we get them certified, and then we buy the products, we pack them, and we export. And lately, for the last for the last uh, three years now, we also import. We also have an American company of our own and a, and a Dutch company. So we also import and distribute our products in the U.S. and and Europe. Um, so yeah, and then um, we got into ginger, right? And, and uh, we started with ginger, and that story is. It's very long, but it's very nice. Well, but and you guys are the very first people to import organic ginger in the United States from Peru. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. It is. We are. We are. Yes. So, so the story is that we had this idea that we wanted to be connected with farmers and we wanted to export product and we wanted to be in the organic produce and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to do many different things. We thought that, that a couple of years meeting all the people in the industry, in the organic industry, what is was enough to start selling product and that that wasn't right so we had a company name we had all the legal paperwork we had an address we had but we had nothing we had just ideas and we invited the guy who was the ceo of the local office of the certifier or mm -hmm. or it was the boss of the boss of our boss <laughs> so it was three levels up but the, but the guy who is, is, is a very good guy, He's, he, he became kind of our mentor. He's a very good friend. Sure. And he, and he came to see us and uh, he gave us a few pieces of advice, very good advice. But then he said, hey guys, I know the largest organic ginger importer in the world. And uh, I have tried to, uh, to put together somebody to ship ginger organic ginger from peru to this guy and everybody who's tried has failed i cannot get involved because i am a certifier um, but i think you're three smart guys you could do it would you like right. me to introduce to introduce you to my friend i would say yes of course obviously so we started emailing with this guy and uh, he was kind of teaching us everything we needed to know about ginger by email so we said okay ginger is a tropical root we know we eat it here in Peru. Uh, Chinese food is very popular, so it must be grown in the jungle. So let's go to the jungle and see where we can find ginger. Right. So we went to the jungle of Peru. We found ginger. It was almost wild. It was, it was absolutely wild growing in the woods. And so we said, we can get this certified organic very, very easy. So we started a little project, very, very little project. Uh, we built extremely little infrastructure mm -hmm. to back and process ginger. We got, we got five growers certified. We started shipping. This guy was teaching us. So we ship uh, first shipment 180 boxes, 30 pound boxes by year. And not arrived in the best condition. He said the hands are too little, too many cats, too immature. You have to fix this and that and that. We made corrections. We ship another small shipment and then another one. And after the fourth one, he said, you're ready for an ocean container. And uh -oh. he said, uh -oh. and, and he, he sent the guy. We, we needed to upgrade upgrade the, uh, the 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 facility. Sure. Which was yeah, yeah, that facility. So a guy came, and when we did everything for the first container, five hundred boxes, we needed to set the temperature for the reefer container. And I asked the guy which temperature, and he said, "Oh, seven degrees Celsius." And we shipped, and it arrived with quality issues. It turns out ginger is a tropical root and it is affected by chilling injury. Right. And seven, seven degrees Celsius was too low. Sure. So the guy said, hey, your product is bad. And, I, and, I, and, and everything, our entire life was in that, those 500 container. 
our our savings or everything everything so if if we if that doesn't work we are done company closed and so i called my dad and said dad i have this problem and he said well you get into a plane and you go to the us and you meet your customer and you and you um are solve your problem and i said that i have i have no money even to put to put gasoline on my car i have money for nothing how high am i going to go to the states and my dad said oh, well what you want to be a businessman businesses work with money so you go out there and get funds to to fund your company and start doing business otherwise shut it down and get a job so my mother in law was working at american airlines here in peru boom she still works there and uh, at the time it was she was my girlfriend not not my, not my wife she's my wife now and um, and i got these tickets that are called standby tickets. Right. You can get into a plane only if there is some room available. Open seat, uh, right, sure, sure, seat. sure. Yeah, exactly. Very, very cheap ticket. And I got into a plane, I went to the US, and it turned out that the largest importer in the world was a retired guy, 70 years old, living, living in Punta Gorda, Florida. And he's, he was operating out of a garage. And his cooler, his cooler was a room smaller than the room where I am sitting right now. And his cooling equipment was a home air conditioner. <laughs> and, and that guy was the largest employee in the world. So I said, okay, we are done here. And, and, I, and, and we were already done some numbers. We ran numbers right. and we, and we know, either, either we sell 500 boxes of ginger per month or we close the company. And he said, no, that's, that's piece of cake. I'm gonna buy you much more than that. So I came back to Peru, and he and he was he was buying like 500 boxes every eight to ten weeks, and we were we were just bleeding. We were we were going to close the company, and and we got accepted in a program from the Swiss government, the Swiss Import Promotion Program, and right. that is a program that helps small companies to export into Europe. So fast forward, we got a boot at, Bio, at Biofac in Germany, the largest organic trade show yeah. in the world. And then we learned very quickly that we needed to diversify. So we came back from Germany and we started um, replicating our, our small scale grower system of ginger in other products. And, and the story, the rest is history. And then and, and we, met, we met Rick Lejeune and we started shipping to the U.S. to to the real to the real guy in ginger, right? Uh, but by the way, this guy in Punta Gorda, we kept shipping him ginger for many many years. We we owe him a lot. So you know, it's such a great it's such a great story because not only do you, you bring up your dad and the reality of what a parent says to a child, right? It's like, okay, what are you going to do, right? It's time. So you got that going for you, and you were backed into a corner. And what I love about your story is is that when you think about startups, you think about brands that are just, they just, you know, some of them just get pushed to the wall and it's just like, how much do you really believe? How much do you think you can do this, right? You get tested. And I'm thinking, you know, looking at who you are now, what you've become, that lesson to me is probably why you're doing some of the things the way you're doing them today, because you had that feeling in your gut of, ah, oh, shit, this is the defining moment. Like I'm literally screwed at this point if we can't make this work, but you kept pressing forward as opposed to going backwards. Dude, that's inspiring. I love it. And to think that you're the first ones that brought, you know, organic ginger from Peru in the United States is a pretty good accomplishment. Thanks for tuning in. Today's Todd Versation is brought to you by the Organic Center. Incredible science, credibly sourced. Learn more at organic-center.org. We, we, we exported the first ginger ever from Peru. Peru as a country never, never exported ginger before. Oh, okay. Now, now you just taught me something. I thought it was, no, sh that's even more impressive. So we, cre we created the, uh, the ginger industry in Peru. I love that. Yeah, I didn't so realize we, that. Yeah, and, and, and at that time when, when we were about to close the company, right. I spent thousands of hours sending emails to every, I, I was Googling and Googling and Googling hours of hours of hours uh, in Google and every website I found with the word ginger, 
I would send a message. And we were just about to shut down the company and organically grown company mm -hmm. got my message. And they sent it to Rick Lejeune at Hit right. Lejeune. Right. And Rick sent me an email saying, hey, I got this message from my friends at OGC. I am a ginger importer here in LA, California. I am interested in knowing you. And the greatest relationship ever started there. And, and, we, did, and, and we didn't shut the company down. Well, obviously you're sitting here talking to me today yeah. and you're, you're, you know, and, and, and you're, you're working with almost what close to 300 farmers now impacting just countless amount of lives. You know, what do you, you guys are probably close to what 2000 acres now that you guys are working with, if not more. I mean, it's just a super impressive story. Plus you guys are diversified. You're doing turmeric, you're doing your ginger, you got passion fruit, you got star fruit, tamarindo. I mean, you've got some really cool items that are bouncing around and, you know, you talked about working with Europe and stuff and, I mean, you're a global company now, right? Just not coming into the United States. You're a global company. And I, you know, in looking and chatting, you're in how many countries now? What, we 15 are, at least? We export from Peru to the U.S., Canada, China, Taiwan, the Netherlands, Spain, France, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, and the U.K. And from the Netherlands, we re-export to other European companies, to other European countries, excuse me, like Denmark, like Belgium, like Austria, like Italy, from the Netherlands, because we have a company in the Netherlands. Unbelievable. And all from a standby ticket on American Airlines. Yes. I mean, think about that. I mean, because you were because you were facing that wall, right? It's like, how are you? You, know, you can't you can't swim from Lima to Florida. It ain't going to work. Right. Yeah. So how are you going to get there? And to have that opportunity. I mean, you know, I'm a big believer in the path that we walk, right? And our, we don't always know which way the path is going to take us. But if we continue walking forward, we continue to press on. Generally, no matter what the roadblock is, that path continues to move forward. And you're a shining example of that. It's such a cool story, dude. Thank you for sharing that. It really Thank is. You. It's a very cool story. Yeah. One of the things that, um, that you guys do that I think is super cool, I mean, obviously, you guys are in the organic space, but you guys are also in the biodynamic space a little bit. Can you share with everybody just a quick... Um, synopsis of, you know, what is biodynamic actually mean? And then, you know, how have you integrated that into your practices and stuff into organics? Because I think it's really cool. Well, explaining biodynamic is a, is a bit Challenge. complex. Um, it's a farming system based on the teachings of Rudolf Steiner. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is related with the moon phases and it's related with some preparations, very specific preparations that you have to apply in the farm in very specific ways, which is a bit complex to, to explain. But what we did is, it, it is so difficult and so complex that people right. have to see it with their own eyes to believe and to start practicing it. So what we did is we bought a piece of farm, a piece of land that was absolutely degraded. Nothing was growing on that soil. It's, right. It was dead. So we started farming um, biodynamic in that farm. We started making a re regenerating that soil, and uh, and then we started mixing mixing biodynamic with agroforestry, which means combining farming with trees, and uh, and now it, it has been a very steep learning curve. Sure, it hasn't been easy. No, it's uh, not an easy process. And, and, and especially because even though we are agronomists, we are not farmers ourselves. We, 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 we were not raised as farmers. Right. So we have the technical knowledge as agronomists, but from the book to reality and to practice, it's, 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 a, it's a big, it's a big uh, gap there. So learning to farm, to really to, to, to farm and produce in this, in this farm we bought, it's been a learning cure. And, but now we have proved it works. Right. And now after a few years, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of land, very productive, very diverse. And uh, so now we are um, and now we're take, taking our growers to see and to show them. If you do this, right. you do that, and the, these practices are beneficial for this or that or that or whatever. And we are taking them to the farm to teach them how we are doing it and how it is working and showing them the results. And now we are recruiting a subset because we work with too many growers. We cannot turn all of them into biodynamic all at once. And because not all of them 
would want to do it. So we have selected a group of them and we are in the process of, of, of getting them certified to have a, a bigger base of, of biodynamic product. Right now, it's only product grown in our farm, which is biodynamic. Right. Which is probably somewhere between eight to 10% of all the volume we sell. Yeah, but you know, when you think about a positive cost of food, right, this is the next step. And the, and the whole, the lesson in that whole story is you took a piece of junk ground, you did what was right, you listened to what it needed to do, you, you know, you, 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 you read in, you know, you read the tea leaves to get it to where it needs to be. And it's a beautiful piece of property. So you put the time and energy in to create something back to where it needed to be or back where it was however long ago. I mean, to me, I think it's just great. I mean, I think it's a positive way to go. It's, it's similar to what some of the regenerative agriculture things are talking about these days. Um, you know, it's about making that positive change. And by making those changes, by taking the steps that you did, you know, your knowledge base is going to make other parts of your business, other parts of your ground even better. So I think it's great. I mean, it's, it's a ri- it's certainly is a risk, too. I mean, it's not biodynamics, not for the faint of heart. And so for you to be able to go do that and to stand behind it and see the results and then start to work with it, I think it's fantastic. So kudos to you for doing that, man. I think it's really cool. Um, one of the things I, I love about you guys, not only the, the whole story and the whole nine yards, and but you guys have such a high level of integrity when it comes to the issue of organic fraud and things like that. And I want to talk about this specifically for a bit because I know it's a, it's a touch point for you. You guys have a tagline that says organic is not enough. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad that you're asking. Um, organic is not enough for us. It has two meanings. Mm-hmm. The first meaning is that organic alone is not taking care of the people and is not taking care of food safety. And in a country wow. like Peru, taking care of people is especially important. Here, seven out of 10 Peruvians live in informality. Informality means, means living out of the legal system. Seven, seven out of 10 Peruvians, that's a huge number. Um, when, you, when you are in the, in the formal economy and you're hired by a legal company, you get a lot of benefits mandated by law. If you are in the informal economy, you get cash at the end of the week. No social security whatsoever if you live in the informal economy. So no health insurance, no retirement pension fund, no paid vacations, no maternity leave, no share of the company's profit. By law, we have to share a part of our profits with employees. So people living in informality does not get that share of the profits. Um, Yeah, so seven out of 10 people are only getting cash at the end of the week. Wow. That means they are exploited basically. Uh, right. Because they are getting very low, very, very low uh, wages. And um, so, so m- m- too much organic product is packed and washed and grown by people in the informal economy. So if you only care about the word organic, but you are not caring about the people, there is a chance that you are being part of these informal illegal economy and 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 also food safety real a real organic program a real trace real traceability real food safety right requires trained people and skilled people yeah informal employees that are getting cash at the end of the week very low wages are not trained are not skilled right so how are these organic companies guaranteeing real traceability, real organic program, real food safety. So that is why we say um, organic is not enough. I love that. On the other hand, on the other hand, organic certificates are not enough. And why I say that? Mm -hmm. The certification industry, in my opinion, have a huge conflict of interest and a perverse incentive. Because right. certifiers are paid by the companies that want to become certified. Certified. So if certifiers are strict, demanding compliance, strict compliance of their regulations, 
they lose their customers. Mm. And that is, that is something so difficult to understand for people in the developed world. Right. Because in the US, in Canada, in Europe, you would not believe that a certifier is willing to close their eyes and, and, and not see what they have to see. Because if they see what they have to see, they are going to lose the customer, right? Right. So, right. but in underdeveloped countries, certificates are a guarantee of nothing. Wow, that's an impactful so, statement. That's an impactful and, statement. And, and and nobody's willing to say it. And and the the problem, the big problem is is that retail buyers, they are obsessed with ticking the boxes of their compliance systems. Right. So the only thing they want to tick the box is the paper that says certificate. Even even if they know that behind the certificate things are not good, they are okay because they have a certificate and they can tick the box and they can put the purchase order. The largest oh. the largest retailers in the US, in Canada and Europe have have these illegal, quote unquote, organic ginger on their shelves. And that is a huge elephant in the room that many people know it is there, but nobody wants to see and nobody, nobody wants, wants to talk nobody about it. Talk about it. Yeah. Well, you know what? We're doing it right now and we're putting it out to a global audience. So you just threw it down to everybody. And I think it's a moment of pause. And to me, you know, it, I think it's a moment of pause that people need to sit there and go, you're hundred percent right with what you just said, that organic certificate is, needs to be more. It needs to be thought of more organic needs to be thought of more. What is actually happening? And I, I think that you're going to find people that listen to this. We have a lot of retailers that listen to this. Um, I bet there's going to be some head scratching right now. Some people pulling some paperwork out of a drawer and wondering, you know, what they're actually doing because, you know, we're an integrity based business. Organics yeah. is so unique because it's all about integrity, right? It's your word. That's really yeah, but, what it comes down to. But the, but there's a little bit of a sad part here mm -hmm. because I I put a ton of effort in telling this, and I tell this to many 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 people every time I, I do. Can. And and many times, buyers said, "You know what? That is your problem. That is your country's problem." You have to solve it there. I have a certificate. I have to trust the system, and the certificate right. is good. In, the certificate is good enough for good me. Good enough, right? Right. Yeah. No. Well, you know, and that's how a lot of things work, right? I mean, you know, I said this. I was on a, a conversation with somebody about immigration, right? We keep talking about immigration, but we don't ever solve anything. If we could just solve something, everybody could adjust to that solution. And it's the same thing there. It's you. We can't be complacent about things. And I think when it comes to food, right, something that touches everybody, something that can, you know, hurt people. I mean, food, food can help you and food can hurt you all at the same time. I think we have to take it a little bit more seriously. And if the red flag's being waved or somebody's making some comment like you've made now, and you don't take a moment of pause to wonder, you're just as complicit as the people that are cheating, trying to get stuff done. It's just bullshit. It's not a way we should be doing things anymore. It's not a positive cost of food. It's a negative cost of food, yeah. right? It just, it doesn't help anybody. I want to get a little bit deeper into this fraud thing because I think, you know, and I know where you're at with it. You know, we chat, we go back and forth. I pay attention to what you say and what you write. And, you know, it's an issue. Um, tell me, you know, you've shared with us a little bit about something we should know, which is the certificate thing. But can you get a little more specific about some of the things maybe that you've seen or, you know, or, or out there that are concerns that, you know, obviously that you shared? I mean, I know there's some people that have had some issues and, and, you know, is the issue working to be resolved? I guess is a better question. Well, I didn't have too many good news about this. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It is. Everybody can see it. Like, like, like these these um, facilities uh, processing and packing organic ginger are there. Everybody can go and see them. Every time we get buyers visiting from France or Germany or the US or whatever, we took them there, we show them so they can see. And food safety is non-existent. Traceability is obviously non-existent. There is lots and lots of ginger in the floor. You cannot tell where it's coming from. 
Um, you can see child working there. It's obviously a child that shouldn't be working there. Um, you can see that people is not well protected and, um, and nobody does nothing about it. Right. It, 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 is, it, is, it is even, you know, my, our customers, they get offers a lot of time from these kind of companies and they forward me the offers saying, hey, look at this, this is so cheap. And, and these emails, most of the times include photos. Right. And just the photos they are sending in the emails are showing the bad stuff. Are showing ginger in the floor, no food safety, no traceability, no nothing. People standing there without shoes on the dirt. And, and, and you say, hey, what is these people thinking about when they send offers with those photos? But the buyers use those offers that include those photos to negotiate better prices. Right. So anybody can go down there to the jungle of Peru and, and those uh, packing and processing facilities are there. So, so they are not hiding. Uh, anybody can see it. Wow. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a problem and it's just not a problem in Peru. It's a problem in a lot of other places with exactly what you said, the way the certification system is set up and how, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of shuck and jive it a little bit and it's not, it's not healthy. What can we do? I mean, you know, in a perfect world, if you had your magic wand and you could wave right now, what does the international community need to do to raise the awareness of what's going on? I mean, just just let alone you got kids working in these places, you know, you've got exploited workers, you got people doing exactly what you're saying. I mean, that's got to get people's attention. Just that alone has got to raise everybody's bar of interest and attention. So what can we do as an international community to kind of help with that? that that's a very, very difficult question. Um because I've, I've been trying to change this for 15 years now and um, spread the message and, and, and try to convince these people that they have to change their, their behavior. I, I, mean, I mean, price is not everything. So I always say that cheap comes with a hidden cost, always. Absolutely. So the price, the price these retailers and, and their buyers are not willing to pay is being paid by somebody else. Right. Somebody is suffering the consequences of that price that retailers are not willing to pay. So um, awareness, awareness, because otherwise the only, the only kind of, I don't know if the, the right word is a solution, but at some point this is gonna blow up in our faces. And, right. some, and some investigation reporter is going to go there and he's going to shoot a film showing all these things. And then they are going to put like this or this or this retailer are putting this product on the shelves. And Everybody, they, and they, and everybody's fucked. Yeah, yeah. And they are scamming customers. And then it is going to be a huge bomb exploding in, 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 in our industries uh, um, in, in front of everybody's face. So, so if people does not change that uh, behavior of thinking only and exclusively about two things, price and certificates. If they don't stop doing that, what they are doing is they are, they are putting the industry at risk right. of, uh, of a huge um, scandal. Well, it, right. But, and, you know, it goes back to what I said earlier. This is an integrity driven business. So as soon as you compromise your integrity, right, you're screwed. Because you can never get that back. I mean, integrity is one thing a person truly owns. Um, and once you compromise that and a business compromises that in this organic space, it's a terrible trajectory. I've seen it through my career where people have been caught doing stuff. And where are they today? They don't exist because they can't come back from that runway. But yeah. you, you raise such a great point that, that to drive positive costs into food, we have to start asking questions about what does that mean and what does that look like? And your point's very valid that, you know, this is hidden costs, these things that somewhere somehow is being affected by these lower prices and things that we're doing. And that's not how we're going to uplift this narrative. It's not how we're going to feed all these people coming. It's not how we're going to change the planet from a climatic standpoint by, by decreasing the amount of organics because we lose the integrity. You see it with food safety recalls. It doesn't matter that it was this guy's product that got recalled. The entire industry suffers. 
right? Yes, and so we have to come together as an industry. And I think the organic community needs to take a moment of pause and say, hey, wait a minute, I want to ask some more questions of people I'm doing business with to make sure that we are actually doing what we believe in, because they do have their corporate mandates. They do have the boxes they check off on their desk and the things that they want. But just because somebody says it's right doesn't necessarily mean it's right. And when you're an integrity-based business, I think everybody has an obligation to support each other's integrity to continue to drive the positive narrative. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure. And, 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 and they have the means to 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 do do some some uh, checkups. For example, um, most most uh, large company retail company now demand some specific certification besides organic certifications. Right. And food safety and, and good agricultural practices and all that stuff. And those those certificates, they have a code. And, and most of the times that code goes in the retail pack. So let's say the global gap number. Right. So with the global gap number, if you are a buyer, you can go to the global gap uh, database. It's public. And you can get the real certificate, the real amount of acres and growers, etc. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if this company is offering me a hundred containers of whatever, but their global gap certificate is for five acres, how right. are they how are they selling a hundred containers with five acres, right? Right. And then and then with that company name, in the case of Peru, you can go to our to our government website. We we have our, our website uh, from our the equivalent to your American IRS, right? It's our, our own authority, SUNAT. And you can get there and with the company name, you can find how many legal employees the company has, how many companies in the system, in the right. formal system. And, and you go and you go to this, uh, you go to check up these companies and they have zero, none, ninguno, wow. not wow. even one. But they, but they have a global gap certificate they have a food safety certificate, they have organic certificate, but they have zero legal employees. And those two tools, the Global Gap database right. and the, uh, our local government website are free, are available to everyone all over the world. You just need to spend 10 minutes in your computer checking how many legal employees your supplier has. Well, it's investing in integrity, right? I mean, I think we have an obligation. I think the whole the system, look, it, we're, if we don't uplift the system, if we don't talk about these gaps in the system and these things, we're never going to solve any of these problems. It's just a, back, back to my thought about immigration. We can talk about it till we're blue in the face, but we need a solution, right? We just can't keep talking about stuff. So I appreciate you sharing this message. And I know that it's something that you've been dealing with for a long time. And I have a, a, a very strong hunch that the people on the other end of this broadcast are going to listen to this probably have some open jaws right now going, holy shit, what is, what do I do? I don't know this. What, what, what did I, what don't I know? What do I need to go know now? And I hope that we empower people to take a step back and recognize that you're working to change the system for the better for your country and for the people that are with you. Right. And if we don't all embrace that, we're never going to get past this point, right? We're never going to be uplifting people and making a difference in the world that we that we can do by coming together on these issues. So I appreciate you going out on a limb and sharing that story. It's a big story. Yeah, right? yeah, it's yeah. a big story. Yeah, I really, I you really know, hope the, the the audience are is listens. They'll listen. Yeah, they're going to listen. I guarantee they're going to listen. If not, we're going to make sure they listen. We're going to keep talking about it because I think it's super important. Like, you know, I, I've been around doing this a long time and. You know, again, I say it, integrity is the only thing a person truly owns. And it's very important that we maintain that all through the supply chain. And we cannot be complacent with it's OK like this or it's OK like that. We need to be asking these questions and we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing because we're serving the consumer. We're serving our planet. We're serving people food. We're taking care of kids. We're, you know, we're doing a lot of really positive things and we should be doing it at the best of our abilities. So, again, I appreciate I appreciate you sharing that story. Yeah. You guys are also. Um, doing stuff inside with, with fair trade, which I'm a fan of fair trade, right? I think it's, you know, I think fair trade is a positive cost of food that we need to be talking about and looking at, you know, we're seeing it here in ag labor. We've got companies here in the ag labor space that are doing things socially, more socially conscious or paying people the right wage or taking care of them. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, but our production is better than the other guys. It's like, wow. 
right? So fair trade reminds me of that a little bit as, as far as, you know, upping the bar, raising the bar, but trying to really embrace the entire agriculture community around its product. So can you change a little, or share a little bit how fair trade's changed your perspective a little bit and what it means to you? Well, what I have to say is that, that there is a bit of confusion with fair trade because, because there, are, there are many fair trade labels mm -hmm. and uh, the pioneering label from Max Haveler in the Netherlands, they started everything in 1988, I think. Right. Um, it's the most uh, known worldwide in the US. Uh, they are Fair Trade America. Right. Um, so with that label, we have a small but very, very nice Fair Trade Avocados program with a wonderful company called Equal Exchange in New England, in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, they, are, they are the best company ever. They are, they are fully committed with, with Fair Trade, Equal Exchange, I mean. And uh, we have this nice program with them. We ship them every year. Uh, five to six containers. That is not too many, but five to six containers of, of fair trade organic avocado from a very small co-op in the north of Peru that are uplifting their quality of lives through, right. through the free premiums. Um, but we also have another label because this uh, this fair trade label, the, the kind of the original one, um, it's it's difficult to comply with because you have to fit perfectly in their definition of a trade and, the, and, and all the growers right. have, must to be part of the co-op and not all of our growers are members of the same co-op. So we have a small program with that label. We have another label, which is called the Fair for Life, mm -hmm. um, which he started, in, started with a Swiss certifier that was bought by a French certifier. So it is now a French label. Um, we have, we have um, more programs with another label. But all the labels have a little bit of a different narrow meaning right. about what is fair. So each one of them have their meaning of what is fair. So to this label, to be fair trade, you have to comply with this, this, and that. To the other label, it is not exactly the same. It's mm -hmm. slightly different. Um, to me, being Peruvian, uh, the most important thing is caring with people. As I said, seven out of 10 Peruvians live in the informal economy. And something, something I didn't say before, in the agriculture sector, it is more than seven out of 10. Wow. So, so these people is completely underprivileged. 30% of Peruvians, 30% of Peruvians are poor. 5% of Peruvians are extremely poor. So, in my opinion, nothing more fair than doing everything in our hands to lift these people out of poverty. Out Absolutely. Of poverty. Absolutely. Uh, and to do that, besides next to the uh, fair trade lab label and next to the, uh, to the fair trade premium that goes to a common cost to build something common for the community and all that stuff, to me, helping lift uh, these people out of poverty is focusing on health and education. So we have we have other programs in-house besides the fair trade stuff that are focused on health and education to help these people. And right. it's, it's to help growers and to help employees. I love it. I mean, uplifting, right? Positive cost of food, making a difference. Now, I mean, it's what you guys are always, you guys are about. And I think it's great. You, you touched on something earlier and I want to just call it out really quick you brought up a you brought up what i consider kind of an organic pioneer the guy's been around a long time he's you know he's just such a cool cat you talked about rick lejeune tell me how he's impacted you and your trajectory as a person as a mentor in your relationship because i think rick's certainly worth a call out thanks for tuning in today's todd conversation is brought to you by the organic center incredible science credibly sourced learn more at organic center Org. Well, Rick is the best ever. He's, he's the best ever by far. Rick, Rick, Rick is, as you said, a pioneer in organic produce. And he has taught me everything I know about it. He's a great friend. 
He's the most transparent person I ever met. Yeah. He's so caring. He's a simple guy. He's humble. He's low profile. I've never, ever seen him brag about his success, his business, his connections, his knowledge, his influence. Never, ever. But he has all of those. Yeah. But, but he keeps all of those for himself quietly without without bragging about that stuff and uh he's so transparent he um he shares all his knowledge with me with me all his wisdom he introduces me with all his friends in the industry with all his customers i know every deal he makes with our ginger who is buying it how much he's paying um i never ever gone around him he has he received hundreds of offers from other people offering organic ginger from Peru. And he has never ever bought a piece of ginger from other company than us. He has been selling our ginger for 14 years now, wow. every, every single week without exception. That is 728 weeks in a row. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's a great stat. I didn't see that one coming. Every single week for the last 14 years, Rick Lejeune and his company has, has been selling our ginger yeah. fully transparently, always letting me know who is buying every single week, every single box. Sure, 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 at sure. Which, at which price. He teaches me everything he knows. Um, yeah, he's amazing. And uh, he's a great dude. Yeah. It is not only him. It is the rest of his company too. Well, for sure. I mean, it's they are very special. They are special. Yeah. They are very special. You know, there, there is, there is a David Weinstein. Uh, David, David is a is a produce industry encyclopedia. He's unbelievable. I used to when I was when I started in the produce business. I used to I used to buy on the LA market. I used to follow behind him like a creep. I used to follow behind him and watch what he bought, and that's how I taught myself how to be a buyer. It's like I followed him. And I followed Ray Haichia, who was at Mrs. Gucci's, and another guy by the name of Rick Toth. Those were the three people that I, I stocked like a crazy paparazzi. And that's how I learned how to buy produce was from those well, guys. David, David is an organic produce encyclopedia. And he, he, is. he is teaching me everything he knows every yep. time we meet. Then there is Rick's uh, partner, Charlie Kay, and Rick's daughter, Elana. Right. They are also beautiful people. They are, they are an amazing company. And they are they are so special, you know. They, they doesn't even have a website. No, he doesn't. I mean, he just yeah. I don't. And he's a yeah. hell of a good golfer too. Watch out for that. He's yeah. a sweet guy. That's I'm. Thank you for sharing because I think he's he's just to your point. He's very humble. He's very quiet. He's kind of in the background in a lot of ways. But he's done so many good things for so many good people, and he's uplifted this industry so much. I just wanted to give him some love on this broadcast. And exactly. And, and there's uh, something funny. There's something funny. He is the age of my father. I am the age of his children, but we get along. We get along as if we were um, high school brothers. Boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. just a great guy. So yeah. let me let me ask you kind of a, a, a little different question. You know, talking about what we've just talked about, I want to kind of come full circle around on it. Since you started Lagrama, right? Since you started years ago, what do you think is the most surprising thing that you've learned? The most surprising thing that I learned in my 15 years in the organic produce industry, I would say it is how small, how interconnected, and how globalized the produce world is. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great way of saying it. Yeah, it, it is amazing because everybody knows each other. Um, you, you can be in Sweden and talking to the buyer in Sweden that works for Total Produce Nordics, the uh, Nordic office of Total Produce. Mm -hmm. And he starts talking to you about a guy in Opie, Oppenheimer, that uh, is working in the uh, Toronto office or the Vancouver office of, for Opie. And everybody knows each other. And then everybody goes to Fruit Logistica in Germany. Unfortunately, no, no more shows for a while, but and then PMA, and it is like, it is a, a what's the word in English? Um, diverse, uh, cosmopolitan. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, diverse and, is a great word. Yeah, and we, and, and it, 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 in reality, it's a small group of people 
feeding the world. Yeah, it really is. It's it's it really is a small group of people, and it, and it's and you're right. They are very interconnected in how we all work together, and it's it's surprising when people realize what's involved in getting food to market and the whole nine yards. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. You know, agriculture is very and it, and it grows on you, right? I think a lot of people get in this business, they never get out of it, right? It's because of that communal, that family feel. Um, you know, it, it, you're dealing with a commodity that does not have a long shelf life. You've got to make quick decisions. You need people that are on your team that can do the same thing. So, yeah, I, I agree with you on, on that. And you're right. In the global aspects of produce is pretty amazing. Um, one of the things that, that, that I know that you did a while back, and I just want to touch about a little bit. I know you went up to Harvard and you attended you did a little business school, but talk a little bit about some of this post-education that you've done. I know Harvard is one place you went. You got into an entrepreneurial you know, kind of a deal. Just touch on that a little bit and what that meant to you and then and share with us you know, some of the other stuff that you've done along those lines. Because I think it's great that you continue to, to try to grow as a person as, and as a leader you know, running this company. Yeah, well, you know, you know, there, there is an organization called Endeavor. Endeavor mm -hmm. is a global organization aimed to lift uh, what they call uh, high impact entrepreneurs. So, and they select every year they select entrepreneurs to get into their into their program. I would say. Right. So I was I was selected as an Endeavor entrepreneur back in two thousand seventeen. So right. when you have a network, you start receiving help from them and network and connections and access to raising money if you want to raise money, which is not our case. And they have these also these um, academic programs, specific tailor-made for Endeavor entrepreneurs. So this program is a Harvard program, but it's exclusively for the Endeavor entrepreneurs. So, so I right. spent 10 days at Harvard with Endeavor entrepreneurs from all over the world, uh, from all, all the industries, People working in satellites, people working in companies, uh, in taxi companies, kind, kind of Uber. Mm -hmm. and I was in organic produce, but there are companies in, in clothing and e-commerce and tech companies, drone companies, uh, all kinds of different companies. So it was an amazing experience because this is people, mo 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 most of them are people in the tech industry, um, that are trying to raise millions of dollars and, and become and eat the world, expanding all right. over. The next Amazon. So, yeah. So yeah. So discussions were around how to scale your business and expand to other markets and raise capital and and right. and with a very special focus on people, because millions alone do nothing without people. So there was right. a very very special focus on people. But besides the Harvard program. I did a one year program at Columbia University in New York City. It was blended. So I went there four times uh, mm -hmm. for, a week, for a week or so each time. And the rest of the time it was online. I was here in Peru. And that program was very impactful because that program was different. That program was, was called uh, uh, Entrepreneurship and Competitiveness for Latin America. So it was exclusive for Latin American mid-sized companies. Right. And, and the, the, the thesis behind the program is that, that most successful entrepreneurs, when they start getting successful in Latin America, they lose focus of their core right. and of their processes. And they start, because they are making money, they start willing to take advantage of new opportunities that are everywhere. They start to get into new segments and new businesses and new whatever, and they forget, they forget their, their uh, hand of the uh, golden eggs. And, right. and, then, and then that hand of the golden egg, which is your core business, what you know how to do, start, right. start, stops producing the golden eggs because you forget about it. You, you, sure, you, sure, sure. you stop taking care about it. So all the program is about processes and focusing on your core. So in fact, at the time we were trying to import organic product into Peru, not produce, but but uh, muesli bars, energy bars, mm. and, sure. and 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 oatmeal and whatever package pack, package product because right. we don't have we don't have the organic offer of, of CPGs here in Peru. So we said right. there's a, an opportunity here. 
people, younger people want to eat organic food and we don't have organic food. Why don't we import? Right. But we were, we were losing sight of our core. Our core is organic produce, uh, not importing CPGs into Peru. Right. So we got back to our, we, we forget about all of those ideas we were having of, of, of doing about doing different things and taking advantage of opportunities and started focusing in our core. So everything is about focusing in your core, in what you are good at, because the thesis is that that process improvement is infinite. Right. So you can become better and better and better and better nonstop. I love it. So yeah, I can absolutely. see, right. So I can see where it really, you know, obviously it impacted you because you not only did you rein in where you're going, but I'm sure that had an influence about feeling good about some of these positive decisions that you're making about impacting people's lives. And I want to, I want to great segue, by the way, because that's what I want to talk about next is how you are impacting them. And first I want to just ask, you know, some of the sustainability type initiatives that you guys are working on and some of the positive things that you're doing, whether it's, you know, maybe touch quickly on the agroforestry project, but also too, um, I want to get a little bit more specific, you know, not necessarily sustainability rated, but I want to talk a little bit about the healthcare initiative that you guys are doing as well, because I think it's worthy of, of time and energy. So if you want to throw something out on agroforestry, go for it. Sure, sure, sure. So, so as I said, as I said, part of re regenerating our, our, our farm, the farm we bought, the graded, includes agroforestry, which means planting trees. Remember, right. Ginger is tropical and it's grown in the rainforest. So that was a wild forest many, many years ago. And a lot of those acres uh, were uh, become farms, right. uh, but without trees, trees are gone. So, so we, are, we are part of our regeneration process is incorporating a lot of different types of trees again into, in, into, into, the, into the system, into the ecosystem. So we did it first with our farm then we got some fair trade money from one of our customers in Canada. And with that fair trade money, we implemented this agro system with a little growers. And now right. that it worked in our farm, work in the little group of growers, we are expanding it to a larger group of growers. We are just right now in the middle of in the project. So buying the trees and selecting the growers and getting the money and all that stuff. In part, it's going to be funded by a customer in California that produces uh, shots, ginger shots. Wow. So, so they are gonna fund part, part of the project of, of doing agro agroforestry um, with some of our growers. And, uh, and, the, and the, on, on the other side, I, I wanted to tell you something. We have a purpose, we have a purpose that we do not mention too much outside La Grama. Right. Because we believe that the translation to English, because it is in Spanish, because we speak Spanish here, we believe, I believe that, that, that the translation to English doesn't have the same feeling as in Spanish on the one hand. But on the other hand, and more importantly, is that without understanding the Peruvian context, it is not that powerful. Right. So if I tell my purpose openly without people understanding the context, it loses power. So our purpose is to deliver quality, health, and improve people's lives. That right? translates pretty darn good. So, so our growers go out of poverty with access to global markets. Our employees, they have a well-paid job with many social benefits, with a special focus on health and education, which I'm right. going to talk a little bit yeah and our consumers get the healthiest ever organic produce so our operations or our farming areas are far away rural areas very far away from the city where i'm sitting right now mm -hmm. um, where there is not much state not much government not much rule of law and not much access to education to health and that kind of stuff. Right. And, and also, most people living in those areas are in the informal economy. Right. So what we do is we incorporate all of our people, our 280 people, into the legal economy. All of them have health insurance. All of them have retirement pension fund and all that stuff. But beyond that, 
we organize um, medical campaigns, me medical checkups. We bring doctors to our packing house. We do blood tests and, 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 and year one, once a year in integral medical checkups. Most of friend. many of these guys have never ever seen a doctor ever in their lives. Wow. Women never ever before they had checkups right. through their through their pregnancies. Right. So they just got pregnant and nine months later they gave birth sometimes at their houses. So our um, women they are they have access to this uh, healthcare insurance. And right. when they when they get pregnant, they have their regular monthly checkups for to see that the pregnancy is going okay, right? But besides that, they get a paid maternity leave. So it's it's three months paid maternity leave for for pregnant women. If people if people get um, sick for any reason and they cannot work, they get their full salary completely paid while they recover at home no matter how many days they they don't go to work. That's amazing. I mean, it's, you know, again, it's a positive cost of food. You're raising the bar. We have to pay by law. We have to pay as a company. We have to pay the first, I think it's the first 21 days. So let's say you get sick and, and you get really sick and you're not going to work for three months. So as a company, we pay the first 21 days and then the insurance is going to pay the rest. And wow. you are going to get, and, and you're going to get your full salary regardless that you are recovering at your house. So, so, so we do that and, and on the education, on the education part, also many of our employees, they didn't finish high school. Some of them even didn't finish elementary school. So we have programs in which you're an employee in our packing house in La Grama in, in the rainforest and you want to finish high school. We mm -hmm. pay tuition. We pay. We pay. To, we pay, we pay for tuition. We pay for the books and the materials, and you have the commitment to go to school after work. And in that, and, and so everything paid by us. It is cheap, but but they wouldn't pay it by themselves. So everything paid oh. by us, and they get their high school diploma. Some of them they are elementary and then the high school. It, right. is, not, it is not mandatory. If they want, they they can access that. Sure. And also, also we have program for their children. So we have uh, people doing voluntary work, employees, that um, the children come to our packing house in the in the afternoon, and our employees help them with homework and help help them with studying for exams and all that kind of stuff. So everything everything is connected to health and education because I am the product of access to health and education. Yeah. So, and I, and I have seen firsthand, I am a witness firsthand of how the lack of access to health and education keeps people in poverty. So what drive us, our driver, of course we want to be a profitable company. We need to make a profit. I need to provide for my family and my, and my co-founders need to provide for their families for sure. We are not heroes, we need to make a profit. But our driver is that as we uplift our own lives, we have to bring with us all these people that otherwise wouldn't have access to health and education. And, and through, through health and education, we improve their lives. I gotta tell you, brother, that translated just fine on the other end of this conversation. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, which is why I asked you to come on, man, because these are things that we need to be embracing. These are concepts and ideas that can work and do work and uplift people and make a positive change. This is how we're going to win the day. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for thank you for what you're doing, first and foremost. But thank you for raising the bar. Right. And, and, and you've shared a lot today uh, about raising the bar and even challenge people to raise their own bar and looking deeper at what goes on. And I know that you've done so many things for the amount of people that you're working with. Do you have a particular story? I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have a particular story about somebody that, you know, you guys have uplifted that you've done something that 
kind of floors you or just amazes you? Well, we, 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 we had a case of, some, of somebody that got cancer treatment that otherwise, otherwise would, would have uh, died, right. basically, be, without access to cancer treatment. We have people who built their house for the first time. Wow. That, and, and, and we have, there, 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 there is, a, there is a, a, a medical test for women. Um, I don't know the word in English, um, but it's a, it, it, it's a test that they, they do with their gynecologist. Right, gynecologist, right. Yeah, and yeah. and many of our of our um, women, it's it's a test that that people with access to health living in the city, right, right, right. Women are doing that test, are having that test every single year of their lives. Right, right, right. My wife get it every year, and many of our women in the in the jungle have gotten that test for the first time ever, for the first time ever in their lives. They never ever got that test before. Wow. Just because they have access to being part of the formal economy, of the right. formal, of the formal uh, legal way of working. Um, yeah, the, the, the person with the cancer treatment was, was, was uh, impactful for me. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, no, and also the guys who graduated from high school. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's beautiful, man. Thank you for sharing. I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot a little bit, but I know that there had to be some ones that touched your heart a little bit. You know, I, you... For you to wake up every morning and do what you do, you have to be inspired, right? And I'm a big believer in inspiration. I believe that if everybody in this country would just, everybody one time a day would go inspire somebody, we'd have a much better vibe in this country today, but we don't. And I think that you guys live that inspiration every day with what you're doing. Who inspires you as a person? Right? Who do you look up to as somebody that gives you inspiration? Well, two people. Rick, Rick is one for sure. Sure. We don't. We all we have said about him. He's so yeah, yeah. special. Yeah. And, and and obviously my father. My my, my father is, is a very very important um, um, person in my life, uh, because he's so wise. And then you 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 learn to appreciate the the white hair. Uh, yeah yeah yeah. People with white hair are really really wise. And uh, damn right we are. You have no idea. I'm like an owl. <laughs> and uh, I'm literally like an owl. <laughs> and he he's so smart and so sharp, and and he has a a, a speed of thought so 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 quick. Like right. I could be I, I could be drowning, literally drowning on a problem that I can solve, and then I go and look him look him for his advice, and like this, he has the right answer, and I said. Damn! Why? Why I am not looking to uh, uh, for his advice more often? Uh, you know, white hair. At, at, at the early days, I was calling him on the phone almost every single day, and then we started getting successful, and then we started working out, and we started doing other products and shipping to other markets. Sure, I forgot about calling him for advice. But when I do, I said, hey, this guy is so smart, so wise, so fast. And uh, yeah, I wish I wish I could have like just a part of his intelligence. Oh, I think you probably do. I think you probably do. You know, I think that you do. But that's neat. Thank you for sharing that with me. Let's um, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's go have a little bit of fun. I'm going to ask you some rapid fire trivia questions. Let's see what kind of answers I get out of him. I'll put you really on the spot right now. Come on, these won't be bad. Those will be pain. Who's your favorite band? Who's your favorite music band? Pink Floyd. Wow, that was a good answer. That was quick. There wasn't any hesitation about that. Well, no wonder you're in the organic thing. All right, what's the best? No, what's the best meal you've ever eaten? Oh, Peruvian food is the best. The best ever. Yeah, it doesn't suck. I'll tell you that much. It's pretty good. Yeah, any 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 local Peruvian food. Every time I travel, I cannot understand how all you guys, not Peruvian, all over the world, can live without our Peruvian food. There you go. There's, there's, there's a Chamber of Commerce endorsement right there. Yeah. All right. Now, something I know people, you know, something I know, and I don't think people actually, you know, some people certainly know this. You're a big surfer. I know you love to surf. So now here, I'm going to find out because I'm going to, I'm going to ask, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to Diego. I'll find out the real truth to this question. What is the biggest wave you've ever surfed on? And don't tell me like a big fish story, bunch of crap. What's the biggest wave you've ever surfed on? 
uh, not not huge waves. Probably my biggest wave has been an eight foot wave. It's big enough. It's taller than you and me. Maybe 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 ten. Maybe ten foot wave. Oh, now it's going to ten. Okay, which one is? Yeah. Is it eight or yeah, ten? But no, no, but, but, no, but no, no more than ten. No. no so do you have any? You any, know, any, you, any, you, you know. Yesterday we are. Um, it's Wednesday today. Yes. Yeah. Uh, on Monday, I broke my favorite board, my magic board. <laughs> it, uh, it has a, and it was the fifth, the fifth time in the ocean of the board. Oh no. And, uh, I got a pretty a pretty big wave on, on Monday and uh, and I couldn't pass it and it broke just just in, in, in the board and break it in two pieces. Why is it called your magic board? Well, you know, we, we say that every once in a while you find the magic board. So I didn't because, know that. So we surfer, we have a quiver, so so we have a few different boards for different waves, and then you buy them and you sell them and you until right. until until once you find the one that is the magical one. So this one was, was magic. One. Yeah, it, it. It, it's 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 from San Diego. It's uh, the shaper. The shaper is a uh, is a uh, San Diego. It's a Brazilian guy living in in San Diego for ages, and he he is shaping the uh, surfboards of for the uh, champions in the uh, world surfing world tour. Wow. I love it. So, and you know what? I love the honesty about the wave. Cause I thought maybe you're going to come out with a 25 footer, just drop some, you know, BS on me real quick. It's like, nah, I'm going to check you up on that. I love it. What's something, what's something's on your bucket list? What's something that you, that you haven't got to do yet and you want that you want to go do? I have a little story here because it's something that I've done before, mm -hmm. but the story is the following. When I was in the Spectre at the certifier, um, I went for one full month, 30 days, surfing to Indonesia. Oh, wow. And, and I got the best waves of my life. And being there in Lombok, in the island of Lombok, we'd, 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 we were five friends. And after the best wave server, I decided I wanted to go surfing to Indonesia every year. Of those five guys in that trip, two of them are still, are still going every single year without exception. Wow. And, and I said, I want to go surf into Indonesia and, and have these waves every year. And the only way to do that is to be my own boss and have my own company. And that, is when, I, that is when I decided that I was going to start a company. It's totally <laughs> so you can surf. It's 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 been it's been 16 years from that day. Wow. And I, and I never been back to Indonesia. <laughs> okay. Because you're in the produce business. What it doesn't shut down. Yeah. The produce yeah. business shuts down when you go to bed. It starts right back up when you wake up in the morning. Yeah, I've never been back. And uh yeah, because when, when you're a company owner, uh, you work harder and more hours than anybody else. Absolutely you do. So, There's no good. But, but going back, going back is certainly on my bucket list. I love it. I love it. I'll go with you. I'll go check it out. Let's go. I'll hang out with you. That'd be fun. I think that could be a pretty cool trip, especially if you can go. I couldn't even imagine going someplace for 30 days. I don't know if I could. I don't know if I would relax or lose my mind or just give up and come back and start working again. I don't know. I have to think about that a little bit. That's fantastic. You know, I got to tell you, man, I, I've done a bunch of these. I talk to a whole bunch of people all the time. Um, I just think you're a, a great dude, a great cat, fun to talk to. I think what you're doing is so impactful. Um, I think it's so necessary that that your message, your vision, your your purpose gets talked more about. And I hope that we did that today. I hope that people recognize the warnings that you that you that you brought up, the points of concern, uh, the points of celebration that you brought up about what you're doing to uplift your people and your community, uplifting your employees. Because if you're uplifting a person that works for you, you're also uplifting their entire family. And that means that they're uplifting their community. And then when their community gets uplifted, the next community can grow from that. And I believe so strongly in how we need to continue lifting up things. And I, I just really appreciate you and appreciate just the, the genuine nature of coming from your heart and how you guys run your business and why you run the business the way you do. And I know that it fuels you. I know it frustrates. I know it's hard. Being in business is not easy, but I know that you're getting fed back. So I have one final question I just want to throw at you really quick. If you only had one chance to tell the world about La Grandma, what would you tell them? 
organic is not enough. Yeah. I, okay. I'll buy that. I go with that answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I go with that answer. And I think you framed that up so beautifully earlier. I, 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 I'm going to go, you know what, that's a hell of a good answer. I'll take that. Yeah. I'll take that. Thank you. You know, again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing and open up your heart. Just, you know, and, and just letting everybody know who you are and what you guys are about. And, and, and I appreciate you coming on and let me share your story with everybody because it's worthy. So thank, thank you. you. It, it, it's been an honor to be here with you, really. Thank, thank you, brother. I, I appreciate that. And uh, I'm coming down. Get ready. I'm coming to Lima. We're going to hang out. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to get the best surf and the best food. Let's go. I'm down. I'm hanging with you. I'll be You're there. Invited. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. And, and, and then we can go to the jungle to see a little bit of how, how those those operations are, are run. I'm all about it. I'm yeah, let's go. I'll bring the GoPro. We'll fill. Let's do it. Let's get a talk. Let's keep elevating the conversation. We're never going to make change if we don't keep talking. You know, we're never going to make change if we don't talk about these things and then we find solutions to them. Right. Because we can just keep talking in circles and solve nothing. We have to stop doing that. And so I appreciate the opportunity the offer. I'm taking you up on it. Never, you never know. You may hear a knock on your door and it's me standing there. You never know. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate you very much. Thank you for hanging out with me. I appreciate everybody watching and listening. Take care. And uh, remember, go inspire somebody today. It's pretty important. I know I'm inspired after this conversation. See you, everybody. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, checking out Todd Versations. We appreciate you watching the broadcast. I hope you enjoy our guests coming up. Uh, La Grama is a very interesting company. Rodrigo is a very cool dude with a very impactful message. Uh, so sit back, relax, and uh, take some notes because I think he's going to blow you away. Uh, appreciate you very much. Don't forget to check us out on our social media channels. Uh, subscribe, rate, review the podcast, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. We're everywhere. Uh, let's push this message. Positive cost of foods is something we need to embrace. So let's keep doing it. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. <laughs>